Hello, and welcome to the Air and Space live chat. I'm Marty Kelsey, one of the hosts of STEM and 30, an Emmy-nominated TV show for middle school students produced by the National Air and Space Museum. We have a great show for you today. We're going to be talking about the Dragonfly mission to Titan, and we're joined by Elizabeth Zibby Turtle, the principal investigator on the Dragonfly mission from the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. We're also joined by Melissa Trainer, the Dragonfly Deputy Principal Investigator from Goddard Space Flight Center, and Ralph Lawrence, De Dragonfly Mission Architect from the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. That's a lot of words. Thank you all so much for joining us today. We have a great show and we're gonna take your questions. So if you have a question, submit it down in the comments section and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Also, let us know where you're watching from. We would love to give you a shout out. Over the last 13 weeks, we've had people watching from all over the world and just about every state. So we wanna make sure that your state or your location is represented. Let us know where you're watching from. Zibby, I wanna start with you. Tell us a little bit about this incredible mission. Thanks. We're really happy to be here today to talk about Dragonfly, uh, which is near and dear to all of our hearts. Uh, Dragonfly is NASA's next New Frontiers mission, and it's a mission to send a rotor craft to explore Saturn's moon Titan. Uh, Dragonfly, the timeline is that we would launch in 2026 and arrive at Titan in 2034. The sol outer solar system is a, is a pretty far <laughs> way away, so it takes a while to get there. Uh, Titan is really interesting because it's the only moon in our solar system that has an atmosphere. And this atmosphere is actually denser than our own atmosphere here on Earth. And it's composed like, uh, like Earth's of mostly nitrogen, but then its next most common constituent is methane. And this means that Titan is rich in organics, which may have had the opportunity to mix with liquid water in the past because Titan is an icy moon and so its surface is a water ice crust. And when that's melted, there are opportunities for the organics and the water to mix together. So Dragonfly is designed, it's like the Mars rovers, except we will fly from place to place to study Titan's composition in different uh, environments, to monitor its weather, uh, and to take images of surface features to understand its geology, and even to listen for earthquakes or Titan quakes. Uh, and really what we want to understand with, with Dragonfly is what are the chemical processes that led to the development of life here on Earth? Because Titan has all of these chemical processes happening uh, and we can't study that here on Earth because there's so much biology kind of overprinting all of the, the ancient history of how you know, chemistry took that step to biology here on Earth. And so Dragonfly is designed to study that prebiotic chemistry and to understand what makes a planet, or in this case, a moon habitable. That is Awesome and so cool. We've got folks watching from Florida, New Jersey, Arizona, Northern Virginia, Queens, New York City, California, Connecticut, and Micah from Indianapolis. Hello, thanks for tuning in and watching. Melissa, you are in charge of the mass spectrometer. First, what is that? And then tell us, what does that tell us about Titan? Sure. So the mass spectrometer is an instrument that is designed to measure the molecular composition of the samples that we can take from Titan's surface. It is able to sort out molecules based on their size and, and look at the way they're kind of the atoms are put together to tell us something about what that composition is. Uh, this is based off of uh, similar measurements we take on the surface of Mars with curiosity. And much like on Mars, what we'll do is we'll drill into the surface We'll look at those samples. Uh, we have two ways we can do that. We can either heat up the samples to, to add molecules to a gas stream and measure them, or we actually have a laser we can shoot at the surface samples uh, to get really large complex organic molecules to kind of come out and, and into the instrument where we can measure them. Um, and so the idea, as it be mentioned, we're gonna be going from place to place on Titan's surface. And we're doing that because what we can see uh, with the images we have from um, flying by Titan is that there's a lot of diverse surface locations where there might be, for example, exposed water ice crust or lots and lots of the complex organics that Zibby mentioned piled up on the surface. Or there are places where, we, where there is um, evidence that there was once liquid water on the surface where organics and liquid water could have been mixing. So by measuring the molecular composition as we move place to place, we learn not only just what's there, but how do the organics that are formed move around? How do they get altered? And we'll be able to look for the types of prebiotic molecules that we know are really important for life on Earth. It sounds like an incredibly interesting place to explore. And, and Ralph, I want you to talk to us a little bit about 
an interesting part of this mission, we're not just going to land, we're going to land and then fly around. So what's that all about? And how, what are we going to learn from that? Well, <clears throat> you've heard that Titan's a really interesting place and, you know, landing anywhere uh, would be, would be really interesting. But because we know Titan's uh, got a very diverse surface, um, mobility is, is a capability it would be really great to exploit. So you can multiply the value of each landing site. And Titan's environment lets us um, exercise mobility in a, a whole different way from, from Mars, for example, um, because Titan has uh, a low gravity. It's about, about the same as the Earth's moon. So, you know, everything kind of happens in slow motion. Um, and it means you, you weigh seven times less on Titan than you do on Earth. Um, additionally, Titan's atmosphere is uh, four times denser at the surface than Earth's is. So it's really easy to sort of push on the atmosphere with wings or with rotors. And, and so we can exploit these two factors to, to fly very easily on Titan. It takes, uh, takes about 40 times less power for a vehicle like a helicopter to hover on Titan than it does on Earth. And so we, we're exploiting that, um, that environment to, to let us move around. Wow, that is incredibly cool. All right, so if you've got a question about the Dragonfly mission, about Titan, about anything related to this mission, please put it down into the comments section. And we've got folks tuning in from Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Oregon, Houston, Minnesota, Colorado, West Virginia, Baltimore, Pittsburgh, Rhode Island, Rome, Italy, and Hawaii checking in. I'm glad to see you guys here, Hawaii. I know the time dis difference can sometimes be a bit of a challenge, so I'm glad that you all are tuning in. Um, Lene wants to know about the true colors of liquid methane lakes on Titan. Zibi, you got any ideas on that one? Oh, Zibi, I think you're still muted. Yeah, I was going to let Ralph jump in here. I saw him on mute. <laughs> he beat me to it. Um, so, so pure methane is actually colorless, like, uh, like gasoline or, or liquid water. Um, methane absorbs a little bit in the near infrared and actually in the red. So if you had a really long column of it, it would look a little bit bluish. And that's actually why the planet Neptune looks uh, a bit blue. But just like water on Earth, if you've got lots of suspended mud and you know, some of the organic materials that are made on Titan that Melissa um, investigates in the laboratory are, are kind of reddish in color. And so, you know, if it's a, a well stirred kind of muddy lake or sea, then it's going to have that color. Interesting. So, so you're saying that you can actually tell about maybe the movement of the waters based on the colors that you're seeing? Did, did I understand that right? Yeah, if we were um, exploring the seas, looking from, from a, a balloon or a helicopter or whatever, um, yeah, you'd see plumes, for example, of lofted sediment. Um, one, one important point to note, though, is that you don't get a lot of color with the ambient light on Titan because there is this organic haze in the atmosphere that, that makes the sky kind of reddish, like a very heavy overcast. In fact, a lot like uh, Mars does on a, on a dusty day. And so the colors would be pretty subtle. Most everything would be just kind of reddish. Interesting. All right. Um, somebody wants to know, and you guys have addressed this a little bit, what you're looking for, but I think the next part of this question is really interesting. What has surprised you all so far in developing this mission and obviously learning a lot about Titan? Melissa, you got anything that surprised you? I think when we first started looking at it and, and thinking about the different locations we would visit on the surface, what surprised me is really how much um, water ice we're going to be able to come in contact with. Um, Ralph mentioned studies that I do in the laboratory. I focus and I normally say laboratory, sorry, Ralph, but <laughs> I love how you say it. <laughs> um, the, and I focus a lot on the organic chemistry and the types of things we can synthesize um, like, like Titan does in its atmosphere. And so I was very focused on that. But when we first started thinking about this mission, I realized a lot of the surface we're gonna be able to access and water ice, whether it's in the crust or it is a former impact melt that, that has frozen over. And, and really thinking through, if we're gonna sample that surface, what does it mean if, if we've got a lot of ice there? Cool. All right, we've got, um, let's see, uh, 
Ames, Iowa, and DC tuning in. Thank you all for watching. Remember, put your comments and questions down in the comment section. We'd love to know where you're watching from as well. Uh, somebody wants to know if there's going to be a camera on Dragonfly, and are we going to be able to see video of it flying from place to place? <laughs> Well, there is, there's going to be uh, more than one camera. Uh, we actually have eight science cameras on Dragonfly, uh, and we have navigation cameras as well. So there, there's a, a nice suite of cameras, similar again to uh, like we have on the Mars rovers. Uh, this enables us to uh, look at um, Titan at different scales. Uh, so um, we have cameras that look uh, uh, ahead from the uh, rotorcraft and that look down on the surface. We even have uh, very high resolution imagers that will look at uh, just right at the areas where we sample materials from the surface. So we can see what we're picking up uh, into the mass spectrometer. Uh, and we also have two cameras on the high gain antenna. So this is the, the main antenna that we use to be able to talk to earth. And this antenna um, is articulated. It can move to, to point uh, and track Earth. It also folds down when we fly uh, because uh, for Dragonfly, unlike a lot of uh, space missions we're familiar with, we actually have to worry about aerodynamics of the vehicle as well. Um, but the, uh, I, I bring that up because the uh, high gain antenna can be pointed. We can use it to point these two cameras around and we can get panorama views all the way around the lander as well. Um, and we'll be able to take images in flight of the surface as we're flying over it. So we'll have a lot of, uh, of, of images. Um, however, as I mentioned, we're doing, a, we have a high gain antenna, we're doing direct to earth communication. So, the, um, so from Dragonfly on the surface of Titan to, uh, to earth. We don't have a fleet, unfortunately, of orbiters at Titan right now. Uh, so we don't have a, a relay satellite. Uh, to, to use for communication, which means all of the information has to come straight from the surface of Dragonfly from our antenna, it's about this yay big, um, uh, to Earth. And so we will not have uh, the bandwidth for a whole lot of high definition you know, TV movies or things like that, unfortunately. But uh, we will have images of uh, a lot of different places on Titan and uh, we're really excited to see what uh, what we find. Ralph, well, the way that the, the um that you communicate with Earth, will that affect where you're able to fly? So um, communication with the Earth uh, influenced where we chose the Dragonfly mission to, to take place. Um, Dragonfly will be able to fly a uh, couple of tens of kilometers during a single flight lasting um, maybe half an hour. Um, and we expect the mission to, to run to more than two, maybe three uh, years or so. Um, we, would, we spend 99% of the time sitting on the ground. I mean, it's a lander that is relocatable, right? It's not always flying around. And we only do the, the raising the high gain antenna to communicate when we're landed. Um, so if you figure out, uh, you know, three years, and one flight every other Titan day, which means once a month, roughly. Um, we, we can't, uh, for example, go from the equator to the pole. You know, it's, it's a regional exploration, not a global exploration. And uh, one of the reasons for choosing the low latitudes on Titan is um, we have a good geometry for seeing the Earth. Um, the northern seas, which uh, are, are interesting for a whole lot of, uh, of reasons, are actually in polar winter when Dragonfly arrives. And so the Earth is never above the horizon. And so we couldn't communicate there. So we, we chose not to try to go to the Northern Seas. Um, so it, it, the geometry doesn't, um, doesn't influence what we do when we get there really, but it did influence where we chose to execute the mission to begin with. Feels like there might've been a little bit of math involved in the mission planning. So there was some math. Um, Isaac <laughs> Newton's uh, laws uh, still apply. <laughs> Awesome. All right, we've got a question, a couple of questions coming in about why did you choose Titan instead of one of the moons of Saturn like Enceladus? Libby, do you want to take that? <laughs> We're all diving into I mean, we all could. I'm sure, I'm sure we I'm sure we all have our our uh, reasons. Um uh so there are uh, so the Cassini uh Huygens mission 
um, the Cassini orbiter that explored the Saturnian system for uh, 13 years, and Huygens, which descended through Titan's atmosphere the, to study the atmosphere and even landed on the surface and took um, an image of the surface, really, um, you know, taught us a lot about Titan. Uh, that was part of the goal of the mission, but it left some pretty key questions unanswered. Uh, one of which is what the compositions of the solid materials on the surface are. We know that there are a variety of materials. We can see that in the spectral data. Um, and we know there are a variety of geologic terrains. Um, but we don't know what these materials are. Literally, we have bright organics and dark organics in some places, right? And we have materials that have a little more water ice in them than others. Um, and so um, because of the, the rich um, uh, chemistry, this really complex organic chemistry, and the fact that these molecules on Titan uh, have the opportunity to have mixed with liquid water in the past, it really makes it a very um, important target for, uh, for a, you know, from a, a chemistry and habitability perspective. And one of the things we're really lucky in our solar system to have is a whole bunch of really cool targets uh, that are all really complementary to each other. And there, so there are a lot of icy satellites in the solar system. There are a lot of satellites that have oceans in their interiors, but there actually aren't that many that have all of this, this carbon material, this organic material. And so that's what makes Titan such an important target uh, to, to understand the chemistry and what can happen when you have all these key ingredients for life uh, sitting around on the surface for, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of years, maybe. Cool. All right. We've got um, a young viewer, Micah, who's six, and he wants to know what he needs to do to come work with you all at NASA sometime. <laughs> well, I'll start with, um, we talked a lot about things like math, things like science. Those are certainly important. Um, but the most important thing is that you uh, really ask a lot of questions about the world around you, right? That you are, find the things that you're passionate about, that you get really curious about them and, and learn about them as much as you can. Um, I mean, a lot of us have gotten here just by, by following our, our interests. And, and of course, along the way, you've got to, you know, stay in school, you've got to do all your coursework. Um, but, but the most important thing is to find what you, you really, really love. Awesome. And I'm guessing when you all started your careers, you thought, you know what, I'm going to be working on a mission to Titan, right? <laughs> so it's, well, it's Ralph actually did that. think that. <laughs> so um, it, it's, a, it's a great question because uh, Micah will be um, in 2034 uh, when Dragonfly arrives at Titan. Uh, he'll be the same age I was when I started working uh, for the European Space Agency on the Huygens probe in 1990. And, and I've got to say, at the time, you know, it was seven years away before we would launch. It would take us another seven years to get to Titan. You know, it seemed, seemed fantastical and, and remote. Uh, and, and yet, you know, it, it actually happened. And, and now it's, you know, ancient history. Um, so, you know, it's good to take the long view and, and plan ahead. So, Mike, a great question. And, and uh, you know, Zibby, I think, uh, you know, when this thing lands and, and is ready to start exploring, maybe Micah can uh, can give you a call and, and come work with you all. I hope so. I hope so. All right. We've got a lot of questions coming in about the distance and the time delay between Earth and Titan and particularly how that time delay affects being able to fly around because it's not like a drone where you get to see the camera real time. How are you all doing that? Yeah, so um, Titan is 10 times further from the sun than is the Earth. And so it takes light uh, about an hour and a half, 70 minutes to 90 minutes to get from Earth to Titan. So the round trip light time, you know, the time it takes for us to see something on the ground and react to it, um, it is, is longer than the, the duration of an individual flight, right? So it's all over. The, um, the vehicle flies itself. Um, and, and you know it's responsible for keeping itself level and and responding to, to wind gusts uh, and you know it, it senses um, its altitude. Uh, it has a, a lidar, a kind of laser instrument, to detect how rough the ground is underneath it. So it selects the the specific flat spot to land on. But we on the ground will you know look at the data we have from Cassini and the aerial pictures 
from uh, Dragonfly, which, you know, in the first first hours of the mission will tell us so much more than we know at this point. Um, so the team on the ground will think uh, that looks like uh, an interesting spot where, you know, maybe some liquid water is interacted with the organics. So uh, Dragonfly, get up, fly 2.7 kilometers on heading 047 and come back. Uh, and and it, will, it will do that. Um, but the, the autonomy is at kind of that sort of autopilot level. Awesome. All right, we've got a bunch of questions coming in about um, what does Dragonfly look like? Does it actually look like a Dragonfly? And then um, the power source and how does it navigate? Does it use a GPS? So can you kind of dive into those details of how it works? <laughs> well, we don't have a, a fleet of orbiters uh, yet at Titan. Uh, so there's no GPS. Um, we, uh, we navigate um, relative to uh, the terrain we've already uh, been at. So we actually do um, have a targeted landing area for, for Dragonfly. Uh, as Ralph said, it's at the low latitudes on Titan. Um, and it's actually near an impact crater uh, that will allow us to explore these very different uh, uh, environments, materials that have had very different geologic histories. Um, uh, but we can land and then determine where we are based on the, the images we have from Cassini and use that information and the information we see once we're close up in situ on Titan to be able to, uh, fly, uh, to, to fly relative to our position to get to, to new places. So we don't actually need um, GPS, which is good because we don't have GPS uh, to do that. Um, and I answered the last part of that first. What are the, can you go back to the other parts oh, it of the was, question? It was, um, is, it gonna, is it going to look like a dragonfly and what's oh, yeah. it powered with? Right, uh, so um, it's an octocopter. It's technically an X8 octocopter. So this means that rather than having eight arms, there are four arms, each of which has two rotors on it. Um, so uh, it does not really look like a, a dragonfly uh, in that sense, except that it does have kind of two levels of, of rotors and, and you know, dragonflies have multiple levels of wings. So, uh, so there's a little evocative there. Um, it's uh, um, it perhaps uh, not, Unlike, and maybe there's a, a picture that, that you can show, because I know you have some of the, the hardware, uh, some of the, the pictures of the hardware. Um, uh, it's not unlike a, a rotor, uh, unlike a rover, um, with, uh, uh, um, except it has skids and the, the rotors. And um, what power is it? So it is designed to use what we call an MMRTG. This is a multi-mission radioisotope thermal electric generator. That's why we call it an MMRTG. The, uh, this is the same power source that uh, the Mars uh, rovers use, that the Curiosity and Perseverance rovers use. Uh, and what we do for Dragonfly is use the power from that. It doesn't actually put out a lot of power. Um, we use that power to um, charge a battery. And so we take advantage of Titan's long days, which are actually 16 days long, uh, to charge the battery, and then the battery is what we use for the actual, you know, flight activities and science activities. The other awesome. benefit of the MMRTG is that it has, it puts off a lot of heat. It's actually fairly inefficient at converting uh, power into electricity. Um, and so there's what, what's referred to as waste heat. There's a lot of extra heat. But on Titan, there's nothing extra about the heat. That actually is what we use to keep the inside of the Dragonfly rotor craft at kind of a, a nominal working temperature. It's probably about, you know, about zero uh, Celsius, about freezing. But for instrumentation, that's actually a pretty good temperature. Uh, and so it actually keeps the, the rotor craft warm so that everything can function um, because Titan itself is a, is a very uh, cold negative 290 Fahrenheit. Wow. Awesome. Exactly. Well, thank you. Um, those are great questions coming in. We've got a few minutes left. Um, we've got uh, New York City, London, Calgary, Portland, Maine, St. Louis, Ningbo, China, Wichita, Kansas, close to my hometown, and uh, Louisiana all tuning in. Thank you all for watching today, and be sure to put those questions down in the comments section. Um, we've got a couple of folks that want to know about the atmospheric density and how that has affected the design of Dragonfly. Yeah, great question. There's um, 
a couple of uh, aspects to it. One is just the, the, the thickness of the atmosphere, the density that makes it easy to fly and ends up being why uh, Dragonfly kind of looks the size and scale it, it, it is. Um, one feature of the atmosphere, and the atmosphere is mostly nitrogen, just like ours, but with a few percent of uh, methane, um, is that the low temperature makes the viscosity of the air, of the atmosphere a little bit less than, than ours. And that means it, the friction uh, behavior and the way flows separates from a, from a wing um, is actually a bit like how uh, that works on Earth at a larger scale. So the blade section of our rotors is actually one that's more typically used uh, for wind turbines on Earth that are you know, much, much bigger. So we have to take that into account. Um, at the low temperatures on Titan, the speed of sound is uh, about two thirds of what it is on Earth. It's 200 meters a second, 400 miles an hour. Um, and you want to make sure that the uh, tips of the blades don't go too close to the speed of sound because that uh, gives you poorer performance. You get lots of drag. So we have to take that into account as well. But this is all actually quite straightforward um, uh, aerospace engineering. And, and actually, uh, we are using a, a wind tunnel at NASA's Langley Research Center uh, called the National Transonic Facility. And the way it, you know, being a wind tunnel smaller than your typical actual full-size aircraft, the way it simulates uh, some of the high speed and high scale uh, phenomena is by chilling down the air by spraying liquid nitrogen into it. It's a sort of cryogenic wind tunnel. And so it, it actually perfectly replicates uh, the conditions on Titan for us. And we'll be using that for, for some of our development testing. That's amazing. And that actually covers the next question that I was going to ask. How do you test that on the for the atmosphere and the gravity? Are you also doing computer simulations or is it predominantly in a wind tunnel like that? There's a, a lot of uh, what's called computational fluid dynamics um, to uh, refine the uh, shape. I mean, as, as far as aircraft go, uh, Dragonfly is kind of ugly because it's doing a lot of things that most aircraft don't do. It doesn't, you know, it has to have a dish that opens up. It's got drills. How many helicopters do you know have drills on them? So, you know, there's a lot of compromises that have to be made. And one of the later steps will be to sort of streamline things and, and let it fly a bit further for a given amount of um, battery energy. And computational fluid dynamics is a very useful tool for, for doing those kind of trade-off studies. So, Mike, if I, I you're looking for a functional. degree, go into that. I'm sorry, go ahead, Zinni, say that again. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, I would say it's functional. It's not ugly. It's functional. <laughs> oh, quite right. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, we've got a question about how this mission compares to the Mars rovers that lived well beyond their expected lifespan. Um, does the complexity of having a flying rover um, cause that to maybe not last as long? Or, or how does that work together? And then I want to follow up with that. How much have you all looked at previous missions to, to see what goes into this mission? Well, I'll start with that. Um, I'm a member of the science team for the Curiosity rover and uh, also for the instrument that the mass spectrometer on Dragonfly was based. And so we took a lot of the same hardware that was developed for that and a lot of the, the sort of lessons learned, you know, whenever you build something and you actually send it to Mars and learn how to operate it from, you know, really far away uh, on another planet, you learn a lot and you think through, you know, what would you maybe do differently? What what new things do you want to build in, new capabilities? Um, I mentioned the laser shooting at the sample, for example. That's, that's a big new development for a new Mars rover uh, from ExoMars that we uh, definitely uh, will be very useful on Titan. Um, and so we think through, uh, right, how long do some of the systems last? Um, I know the question was specifically about, about the flight system, but, you know, the things that we think about are what are the true consumables, right? What are the real things that might go away? Uh, over time. Uh, we have some items on the instrumentation, for example, we need these, these vacuum pumps to help, Titan has a very dense atmosphere, as, we, as we've heard, but our instrument likes to operate in a vacuum. So we had to have vacuum pumps that suck the air out. And it turns out after you spin those at 100,000 RPM for, for so many hundreds and hundreds of hours that, you know, they tend to sometimes, you know, fall apart. <laughs> um, we have a limited number of sample cups. So we think through, you know, how long, how long will those go? Of course, I think we have way more than we need 
for our nominal mission. And that's another lesson from Curiosity. Curiosity has a limited number, but hasn't used them all yet, even in the extended, extended missions. Um, and, and then that'll go into things like thinking about the power source. Um, you know, as Libby mentioned, we're designed to use this nuclear power source, so it should last for, for uh, a very long time beyond the initial nominal mission. Um, and, and that'll factor into how long we think we can last. And as, as amazing as the flying is, and it helps us reach all of our, the key, you know, diverse locations where we're looking for interesting chemistry, uh, there's a whole lot we could do too, if, if for some reason we weren't able to fly, fly so far as easily, there's a lot we can do on, you know, on the surface in a location. Okay. Yeah, and it's, it's very important to, um, to, you know, learn the lessons from previous missions. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we certainly made an effort to do that. You can see a lot of books on the shelf behind me. Most of those are, um, you know, mission, uh, books about uh, previous space exploration. I mean, I, I've even written a few myself. I wrote, <laughs> co-wrote the, the book on time tree landers. So, um, yeah. Uh, and of course, we have a, a very broad team that bring experience from a whole other set of uh, NASA and, and other agency projects. Awesome. Well, we're getting a bunch of questions wanting to know, how are you going to land once we get to Titan? What what does that look like? I, I guess maybe that one's for me. Um, so the uh, vehicle um, flies through space uh, encased in a heat shield because it, it uses Titan's atmosphere to slow itself down. And Titan's atmosphere is actually the, the biggest soft cushion in the solar system. It's um, it's a very easy place to uh, to enter, descend, and, and land because the atmosphere is so dense and so extended. On on Mars missions, they talk about the the seven minutes of terror when you know they're screening in at seven kilometers a second and they've got to throw out the parachute at Mark 1.5 and then deploy this thing and you know do it all before they hit the ground. Um, because Titan's gravity is low and the atmosphere is so dense, we actually have two and a half hours to do all that. So we uh, we descend on the small parachute and then get near the ground, let the heat shield fall away, then the radar on the, the vehicle will pick up the ground and will we'll drop out of the, the heat shield um, and, and fly and land under our own power. Um, in fact, when you go through the exercise of thinking, how, what, what bits do you need to work to land on Titan? It turns out you really don't need to add anything else to take off and land again. So that, that, in a way, is where the, the, the concept sort of came from. Um, so our first landing, sure, will be um, an apprehensive moment because it'll be the first time we're, we're doing this. But in principle, it's just the same as all the other landings we'll do later on. All right. Um, a couple of folks want to know about the atmosphere of Titan and does it have weather and how are you accounting for potential storms? Yeah, so that's a that's a great question, um, and one of the things that Cassini uh, did in the the thirteen years it spent observing Titan uh, at at Saturn was um, to watch the weather, to watch the atmosphere, to see how things change on Titan. Uh, so as I mentioned uh, Titan's day is uh, sixteen Earth days long, so it's it's a very long day um, compared to what we're used to. Uh, but Titan's year is also very long. It's 29 and a half years long. So each season on Titan is several years in and of itself. And one of the really nice things about arriving in 2034 is that it's actually one Titan year after Huygens arrived. And so that means we actually have measurements of the, the deeper part of Titan's atmosphere at the same time of year. The other thing um, this means is that, uh, as Ralph alluded to, it's, it's northern winter or southern summer. Uh, and so because of Titan's, uh, the, the Citrinian system's tilt, uh, like on Earth, at this point, there's no solar illumination of the North Pole and there's constant solar illumination of the South Pole. Uh, so this will be late southern uh, summer. It's kind of January in our time frame, in our calendar. and all of the weather activity that Cassini observed, the methane clouds uh, and the methane uh, rain in this time of Titan's year were at the South Pole. It wasn't for several more years um, until Cassini started to observe weather activity at lower latitudes. 
uh, like the kinds of latitudes that we're going to. So uh, the expectation based on uh, the weather forecast from Cassini data uh, is that there um, are unlikely to be storms at the time of year when we're exploring the low latitudes. Now, it, you, you mentioned that sometimes missions have longer durations. Our nominal three-year duration would keep us within that, that late southern summer uh, season. Uh, in the longer term, perhaps, uh, if we're able to keep exploring, uh, we might start to see clouds at, um, you know, at the lower latitudes and even observe rain. Um, and, uh, and that would be fascinating. We can't guarantee, of course, that the weather prediction based on the Cassini data is right. And so we do have to make sure that we're, uh, you know, that the design is robust to being rained on um, and to, to wind. Um, and Dragonfly would go through the same kind of pre-flight checklists that we go through here on Earth uh, to check the wind and make sure that all the conditions are, are suitable for flight, flight before flying. I'll say one other thing about the rain, which would be, be cool, um, is that the raindrops on Titan are, are large and they would fall at about the same rate as snow here on Earth. And so it would actually be really pretty cool to watch it, uh, but, but we don't think we're gonna be there at the right season to be able to, uh, to watch that happen. And, and that leads into the, the next question that we have. There's a lot of questions about the methane in the atmosphere and um, are you worried that it could ignite? And then also, was there any thought about that being able to provide any kind of power for the mission? Well, I'll, I'll answer that question as the chemist on the, the call. Um, so the, the most important thing, you know, we, we need two things for combustion when we think about things igniting. Um, methane is an excellent fuel on Earth, but the other thing you need is oxygen. And Titan actually doesn't have any oxygen in its atmosphere. And so for that reason, we're, we're safe from doing that. But that also sort of answers the question. It's, it's not really a, a viable fuel source either. <laughs> All right. Um, somebody wants to know, how long does it take to prepare for a mission like this? That's a very good question. Um, so the, the announcement of uh, opportunity, in fact, the draft announcement of opportunity for this mission, for the New Frontiers program, uh, came out um, in January 2016, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, so we've been working specifically on the Dragonfly mission concept uh, since, you know, for, for about four years in, you know, in earnest. Um, however, uh, people, um, including Ralph, uh, have been thinking about ways to fly on Titan uh, for 20 years. Um, and so a, a lot of the mission concepts uh, are based in, you know, previous exploration. Um, and previous, uh, you know, previous mission concept uh, development activities. So a lot of times there's, you know, this kind of groundwork that's done well before you start the specific mission design. Okay. Uh, somebody wants to know, how is Dragonfly going to navigate through the asteroid belt? Or will, will well, you maybe fly? Maybe I'll, I'll take that. We, um, the asteroid belt is not um, not as, as as dense and scary as it's often portrayed in sci-fi movies. There is an awful lot of empty space out there, and, and of course, we 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 know we've cataloged um, thousands uh, of asteroids. We know where the where the big ones are. Um, so uh, the trajectory is designed to um, uh, you know not not fly into any ones we know about. Um, in a way, it's, uh, it's a little bit sad. A lot of um, missions that have gone to the outer solar system, uh, like Cassini, for example, or Rosetta, have had the opportunity to look at uh, asteroids uh, on, on the way. Um, but we can't do that because we're all huddled up inside our heat shield. So we, we can't see out. There won't be any, uh, any cruise observations. Okay. Um... Somebody wants to know if there are any eventual plans to send a submersible probe that it could explore bodies of liquid hydrocarbons um, like there might be on Titan and then um, any future missions after Dragonfly. Well, I, I hope there are many future missions after, after Dragonfly. Um, 
there have been actually NASA funded studies of submersibles on, on Titan and there's a very interesting buoyancy control problem uh, when you look at the thermodynamics of um, uh, low temperature methane, it's very familiar actually in the liquefied natural gas industry. Uh, the way you blow the tanks on a submarine um, wouldn't work at the depths of Titan because the air actually dissolves in the liquid. Um, but those sort of studies are, I think, 25 plus years away from actually happening. Uh, the three of us were involved um, uh, 10 years ago in a project uh, to make a slightly less ambitious um, exploration of the seas, a, a capsule to float around on on one of the seas, uh, Ligia Mare. Um, and uh, that project was um, basically got to as far as where Dragonfly was about uh, a year ago. Uh, it wasn't selected for flight, um, but the three of us, you know, looked at where we would splash down and Melissa designed an inlet system to suck in some of the liquid and I worked on testing sonars. So, you know, for every mission that flies, there are a whole range of concepts that get explored to different levels of technical maturity. Um, so, as, as Ibi says, some of these things take uh, decades to actually uh, reach fruition. Uh, and Titan has such a diverse um, uh, landscape with seas that you can imagine exploring them with vehicles like submersibles. It seems very much like you all are on the cutting edge of writing real life science fiction. That is so incredibly cool. We've just got a couple of minutes left, and I want to end on this question for each of you. Um, what is your wish list of discovery? And this is a question that came in. So what do you hope that we find when we dis when we explore Titan? Melissa, let's start uh, with you. Uh, uh, I can start. Maybe we should let Zibi have the last word as the <laughs> PI. Um, so for me, um, my my wish list is that when we get to the the former impact crater that that we're aiming for, and we dig into the soil and we measure the composition of, of some of the ice and organic mixtures, that we find evidence of we find amino acids there. So we know that amino acids are a critical uh, type of molecule that forms uh, proteins and is a really important part of our biochemistry. And and that's sort of like for me the number one thing I'm hoping that we find uh, when we get to the surface of Titan. Ralph, how about you? What's your wish list of discovery? Well, I think it'd be really uh, fun to encounter um, uh, like a methane spring. I mean, we, we land among some sand dunes. Um, we expect things to be pretty dry. And, you know, Mars exploration is of a pretty dry world, at least in the current uh, climate epoch. And so seeing like a little stream of liquid methane dribbling out from the, the base of a hill and being able with dragonflies um, weather sensors to sort of sniff that it, the air is a bit more humid there or something, maybe see a little bit of fog. That, that would be kind of cool. Zivi, how about you? What's your wish list? <laughs> um, it's a very long list. The uh, <laughs> um, one of the uh, one of the really exciting things for me about this mission is uh, all the different ways we get to explore the Titan environment. Um, by putting, you know, we get to, to focus on the chemistry measurements, but really put them in the context of the environment, of the atmosphere, the surface, and, and even the subsurface. Um, and a lot of times the discoveries, you know, that, that you really, um, that, that a lot of times missions discover things that you can't predict. Um, and so I'm, I'm looking forward in particular to all the questions that Dragonfly raises uh, for the next missions to come along to answer. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. I want to remind everybody watching, um, first of all, thank you all for great questions today, but be sure to tune in next week. We have a pilot panel. We will have Shasta Ways, an Afghan refugee who became a, a, a civilian pilot, as well as a U-2 pilot joining us. And then the following week, we'll be talking to uh, another pilot, Tammy Jo Schultz, who you may have seen in the news for landing a, uh, an airplane that had... Um, some mid-air problems. So uh, be sure to tune in the next couple of weeks to learn more about piloting uh, from some absolutely awesome pilots. So um, Melissa, Ralph, and Zibby, thank you so much for joining us today and answering our questions. And for everybody watching, thanks for tuning in.